Marcus. Here's Dex. Hello, everyone, he says. <laughs> How are you, Dex? Are you OK? Oh, yes. <laughs> Dex is enormous. After having such a large friend as Dex, which is very, very big, look. Can you see? Rather handsome. He's got some fantastic spots on his tummy as well. And he's very proud of those, aren't you, Dex? Oh, yes. <laughs> OK. <laughs> I'm going to put him down. <laughs> But anyway, Dex is responsible for one of the stories and he appears in one of the stories as well. <laughs> OK, so um, <laughs> he is. Dex is very cute. <laughs> OK, so this is what we're going to do in, 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 the, in the session today. Very short and simple. Uh, we're going to look at why we use stories, um, what kinds of stories we can use. Um, I'm going to share three different stories and some suggested activities. And then we'll just look at some tips for storytelling. So the approach I'm gonna take is that you'll be seeing things on the shared uh, screen there, and I'll be telling the stories. Um, and um, as I tell the stories, I want you to be sort of thinking about what you see, what you hear, if you can see me do things, to come up with your own set of tips storytelling you might see me do things which you don't agree with so that's you know that will support also some of the things that you think about storytelling um so uh i thought i'd start uh, yes and i don't have any polls or anything like that but i do like to ask participants questions and um, get you to um, type the answers in the chat box so one of the things i thought we'd start with is just to get you thinking why do we use stories so if you just want to have have a little think and just write one idea in the chat box. Why do we use stories with our children pre-primary from the ages of three to six years old? Why do we use stories? Because they are motivating. That's a lovely reason, Svetlana. Thank you. Yep. And Tetiana also said the same thing because we all love a story. Of course we do, Margie. To reinforce and recycle language. Thank you. That's Ezedin. <laughs> To engage the children, lovely Lolly, yes. Because children love stories, Pilar, of course they do. And they're interesting for children, yes, they're very much part of the children. They're funny, they involve their imagination. Yes, they're habitual for them in the sense that they're very much part of what the children are used to, yes, storytelling generally. <laughs> okay, lovely, brilliant, some good, good reasons there. <laughs> okay, so here's just a, a summary of, I mean, this is not all the reasons. I have a, a sheet with over 20 reasons for using story in the, in, the, in the classroom. But these are just a couple which I think are probably uh, the main reasons. Um, so children love stories. Many of you came up with that. Um, they afford a socially rich experience. There's nothing more wonderful than sitting together and sharing a story. Um, and I think it's really important for us to do that in the classroom, to have a shared social um, experience. Um, they develop the children's listening and concentration skills, because when we are working with, with children in pre-primary, we aren't just developing their language skills, but we're developing the whole child and story can by helping them um, develop their listening skills in English in this case, but also their concentration skills, which will help them generally. Um, they provide a very natural and relevant context for language, and many of you said that we engage the children, but um, we usually choose stories where the children are likely to know some of the language. So, um, and because they know some of the language, they feel extremely um, positive and happy that they can understand what's being shared and it gives the, the, the language they know a context. Um, and of course, stories can have, um, or at least the stories that we should be choosing, can have repetition and cumulative language. Now, if the story has repetition, then it means the children will be exposed to a repetitive structure throughout and that will help them acquire that structure. If it's cumulative, meaning, meaning it builds on what came before, um, and this again um, will help children um, pick up language. Um, the story itself is a very predictable routine in the sense that we all sit down, we might have a, um, a song or a chant or a rhyme to start with um, uh, to get children focused. 
um, and there will be a beginning to the story. We know that, or children know, that stories have a beginning, a middle, and an end, and it's predictable. And there will be, when we get to the end, there will be a time when we reflect about what we did in the story or what we heard in the story um, and um, talk a little bit about it. Um, some stories, although those that I've chosen today haven't really touched on sensitive issues, but there are some stories which can help children um, in relation to issues which are a little bit more difficult, such as um, maybe um, a child is struggling because they have um, a baby sister or a baby brother has just been born. And there are picture books um, which um, talk about or share um, experiences of or tell stories about children who have baby siblings. Maybe a child has lost a pet. And there are stories which, um, which are about um, lost pets or, or pets who have died or family, um, close family members who have passed away. There are stories about that too. Or wearing glasses for the first time. There are stories about children wearing glasses or going or, or moving, moving to a new school and uh, a new country. And there are stories about that too. So stories can address sensitive issues and, and therefore they're very important to include in our classroom. Um, and they can include, they can support curriculum links in the sense that a story might be related to something which the children are doing in the classroom with their mainstream um, pre-primary um, educator, like um, The Very Hungry Caterpillar by Eric Carle, which talks about the life cycle of a caterpillar, and they might be looking at that um, in class. Or they might be talking about professions with their, um, with their classroom educator. And you can tell a story about professions as well, which connects to that. Um, or they might be looking at vegetables growing in the garden. And you can tell a story about um, um, a vegetable or uh, making soup or how. And they, that's right, Margie, they can be a springboard for other learning experiences. So, I mean, these are just some reasons why we use story in the classroom. They are fantastic. So, these are the reasons. Um, so, what kinds of stories do you use? I've already mentioned um, a kind of story in my examples. But what kinds of stories do you use with your children? Would you just pop something there in the chat box? What kinds of stories do you use? Animal stories, okay. Funny stories, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Adventure stories, family stories, tales, okay. Legends, right. Okay, I'm going to put up my list. Fairy, traditional stories, thank you. Yes, Yvonne, traditional stories and fairy tales and magical stories. Yes, I'm going to put a list up here of the kinds of stories that we can tell. And fairy stories and traditional stories are there, really. Invent stories. I don't know if any of you have ever invented a story to tell with your children, but sometimes um, it's it's suitable and can be done. Um, there are stories in course books. If you use course books, there are many pre-primary course books which are story based, and so um, they will have a story in each unit. And I'm sure that you use those stories with the children. Uh, there's a lovely one there, Natalia, life stories, yes. <laughs> um, um, I don't know if any of you use readers or learner literature. I'll look at that in a little bit um, in the next slide, so we'll jump over there. Traditional stories, many of you, or some of you wrote fairy tales or traditional stories, so stories as morals or fables or legends, and we'll look at those. And picture books, um, which is something I mentioned, and I'll look at those in a little bit more detail in a bit, okay? Folk stories, yes. Okay, um, so let me just mention before we move on, readers and learner literature. Now these are books and Macmillan has many of them and most publishers, especially language publishers, um, publish these kinds of books. And they are created and written for uh, children to learn and to read. And often they are not very easy tell in the classroom as a story because they are written specifically for helping children read. So it's not usual that we use these um, kinds of books with our children in pre-primary. Okay, um, I just wanted to say that before because some of you might feel that some of these readers might be suitable 
and um, though they are very useful for helping children to learn to read and the, the actual act of reading, they aren't always very um, easy to share or tell um, um, in, in the classroom, okay? Because that's not their purpose, okay? Um, course book stories. Um, many um, um, course books have stories and Discover with Dex, which is sponsoring this particular webinar, is a story-based um, course and um, there are many forms of stories. You could have a big storybook or a flip over book where there's a flip over chart where there's a great big uh, image of the story and it flips over. Um, these are story cards in Discover with Dex um, and uh, they're, they're quite big um, and I've got some over there but they're too big to bring across. Um, and um, this story, the one that I'm going to share with you, is, um, is from Unit 7 in Dex 1. So this is a book for four-year-olds, okay? Um, so I'm going to share this story with you. And as I'm sharing the story, I want you to think about three things. Because if a story is written to fit into a course book, invariably it will have a specific language focus, okay? It'll be written for language learning purposes. And the stories in DEX not only fit in, um, have a specific language focus, but they also um, support the development of a concept and um, they have a value, okay? So while you're listening to this story, I want you to, to think about what the language focus is and what the concept is, which the children are developing in this particular unit, and if there's a value that you can pick up, that's a little bit too, that's a little bit difficult that last one, okay? And as I'm sharing the story, as you listen and you look to, look at the pictures, pick up some tips of how to tell or possibly not to tell stories. <laughs> it's quite difficult telling stories on a webinar, but anyway, let's see how well I can do it, okay? So this is the story. Where's the missing chick? And you'll see that that Dex is in the story. Look, there he is. Can you see him? And there's Meg and Charlie. And look, they're at the farm. There's the farmer. Oh, can you see the chicks? There are one, two, three, four, five chicks. <gasps> but look, there are one, two, three, four, five, six eggs. And of course, if I had this in my hand, I'd be pointing to the eggs. Oh dear, Dex is worried. Six eggs and five chicks. <gasps> Where's the missing chick? Can you see it? And Natalia is very clever because she can see the chick, but Dex can't see it. Oh, look, what's that? It's a sheep. <gasps> Hello, sheep said Charlie and Meg. Ba, ba, ba. Oh, what a noisy sheep, said the farmer. Oh dear, look at Dex, he's worried. <gasps> Where's the missing chick? Look, can you see Buddy? Well, I think that Buddy knows. Woof, woof, says Buddy. That's right, you Miller. He's behind Dex, isn't he? But Dex can't see. Look, what's this? It's a goat. Hello, goat. Oh, what a noisy goat, said the farmer. Oh dear, said Dex. Where's that missing chick? Dex is worried. That's right, Begonia. The missing chicks is behind Dex, but he can't see it, can he? Oh, what's this? And by now the children, of course, will be calling out the animals because they will know the animals. Um, it's a duck. Hello, duck, said Meg and Charlie. Quack, 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 quack. Oh dear, what a noisy duck, said the farmer. Dex is looking very worried, isn't he? Where's the missing chick? Can you see it? Of course, you're all very, very... Um, observant, aren't you? You can see the chick just in his rucksack. That's right. <laughs> Next picture. Oh, 
goodness, what's this? It's a cow. Hello, cow, said Meg and Charlie. Moo, 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 said the cow. Oh, what a noisy cow, said the farmer. Dex is my name. He's looking and he's looking. Where's that missing chick? Oh dear. Ah, oh, look. There's the chick. There's the missing chick. One, two, three, four, five, six chicks. Pew, 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 chip, 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 chip. What noisy chick, said the farmer. What noisy chicks. Okay. And that's the end of the story. <laughs> so that's the story of where's the missing chick? And of course, Dex was very worried about that missing chick. Was and he found it at the end. Okay. <laughs> so, what was the language focus? If you remember, um, I asked you what was the language focus. What was the concept that Jordan was supposed to be picking up? And if you could. But the value as well. Any ideas? Do you just want to try and answer? Oh, we've got some answers coming up here. Animal vocabulary, absolutely, yes. And they're revising numbers. <laughs> now, Maria, interestingly, the place and prepositions isn't actually part of this because um, the story itself doesn't actually include that. But as you saw, the children see things in the illustrations and we can use what they see to um, introduce English as well. Okay, so we could, of course, that they will have picked up the idea of in the bag because it will be part of the story, but it's not actually the focus of this story. Um, so yes, it's farm animals, that's the unit that this story comes from. And of course we've got what's this and it's a, uh, and what a noisy, those are the main focuses there. But of course there was lots of other language coming out and you've picked up a lot of that, okay? Um, the concept was noisy and quiet. Now we only heard noisy in the story and the, um, the, the story activities in the course book, of course, develop the two concepts, noisy and quiet, the opposites. It's always lots of, it's always useful for children when you're looking at a concept to introduce the opposites. And the value, I'm not sure if any of you, oh, we've got the love to love animals, lovely. <laughs> but the value is actually looking after animals because in the illustrations, all the animals are being fed. OK, so we talk about how to look after animals by feeding them and giving them water. OK, so these are the things that come up in the stories that we find in course books because they are written specifically to suit a particular unit of work or to de and to develop certain language items and concepts and values in this particular case okay and as you many of you mentioned um yes other language of course um emerges as well and in this particular story the preposition in the bag is a nice one that comes up too okay because the children see things in the illustrations and of course they're going to be talking about them and so we need to respond to the things that they say. And that's very important to respond to what the children say during stories, okay? Okay, um, I don't know if anyone has any comments to make about that, um, about that particular story. It's a typical course book story. Any questions you might have? I'll keep looking here at the chat box to see if you've got any questions. It's taken a while to come up. I can see that people are typing but I can't see what they're typing yet. Oh that's an interesting point Margosha. Yes, it's a nice story, especially interesting from children for children from cities. Yes, it is. You're absolutely right because some children depending on 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 the level of socioeconomic status that some children might not be familiar with the, the country. They might not have visited the country. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um Cost Costitania, um do I make up my own stories? I wrote the stories for this particular course. Yes. Um, but normally when I tell stories, I use either the story, um, I like to use picture books in particular. <laughs> okay. Right, I'm going to move on. Okay. Um, 
because in relation to this particular story, of course, if it belongs to a course book, then it's readily supported by all of the elements of the course. So there'll be activities in the course book, the worksheet activities, which will reinforce some of the um, understanding of the story um, and the language that's used. Of course, there'll be activities uh, suggested in the teacher's book to reinforce um, how, to, how to tell and what to do with the children. Of course, retelling is very important. When you tell a story, you don't just tell it once, you tell it several times over a period of several lessons. You might tell it once or twice in the first lesson, once or twice in another lesson, and you can keep telling the story. And it's the repetition of these stories which helps the children acquire the language, okay? Um, because we have um, story cards, meaning they're separate cards, then this enables the children to sequence the story, which is a really important thing for children to do in terms of understanding how a story works. So that's really nice. Um, and in this particular course, each story is role played. So the children, uh, there are props which are suggested and um, different things in the activity book for the children to get out so they can retell or, or play act, role play the story with props. And there's also a little mini book as well, which is part of the course. Here it is. And this mini book is a fantastic, it's a replica, a mini replica of the story which the children can take home and tell or share with their parents which of course is a wonderful home school link which again is very important when we have English in school is to encourage children and parents or school and parents to make connections. Uh, what I like about this particular mini book is the fact that the children are asked to indicate whether they liked the story or not. So they're being asked to think about their feelings towards the story. Okay, that's a nice thing to include in pre-primary. Self-assessment is something we use in primary, but we can also use it in pre-primary, okay? So a, a story in an ELT course book is complete in the sense that it has a lot of support for you as a teacher and um, is written specifically for um, language learning, okay? Now I'm going to look at another kind of story which is not necessarily written for language learning, although the one I'm going to share with you is. Yes, the mini, mini books are fantastic begonia and a really wonderful way to bring in the family. Um, and it gives a great opportunity for children to, uh, it's a visual support for them to retell little bits of the story which they have picked up in the class. And of course, you wouldn't give them the mini book immediately, you would give it to them at the end of the unit of work. So possibly you're working with the children for eight units or eight lessons on a particular uh, unit. And at the end, during the eighth lesson, they will prepare the mini book and take it home when they're feeling very confident about the language of the unit and the language of the story. Yeah. Okay, so this next story is a traditional story, and here are three examples of traditional stories. Little Red Riding Hood, which I'm sure many of you know and have a version in your own language in the countries that you live and work. The Three Little Pigs, yeah, and The Gingerbread Man. Now, The Gingerbread Man um, is based, I think, on, there's, I think there's a German version and there's a Russian version I discovered not long ago with a colleague who lives and works in Germany. Um, can you think of any other examples of traditional stories that you know? Traditional stories like Little Red Riding Hood, The Three Little Pigs and The Gingerbread Man. Cinderella. Okay, Daddy, a Cinderella is a little bit different in the sense that it's um, more of a fairy story, yeah? Thinking of the traditional stories that we... That we um, learn as children. Okay, The Little Red Hen, that's a lovely one. Yes, I've picked up on that one. Good. Billy Goat's Gruff, lovely Ed. Okay, great. The Turnip one, which is the gigantic or the enormous turnip. Yeah, that's a Tolstoy story. Stone Soup, lovely Margie. That's a nice one, Stone Soup. Goldilocks and the Three Bears, yeah. Uh, the Wooden House, okay, Titiana, I don't know that one. Is that a traditional one from where you live and work? Snow White. Snow White and Cinderella are a little bit more complex. They're more like fairy stories, but Goldilocks is a good one, yes. Snow White, again, is a little bit complex. The Hen and the Rose. Wow, these are possibly traditional ones from your own countries. That's fantastic. Yes, Kolobok. That's the one. That's, uh, that's Nazdia who has shared that one. That's, that's like the gingerbread man, isn't it? 
Yeah, and the ugly duckling. Okay, yes, you've got it. There are loads and loads. Olga, Alice in Wonderland is a little bit difficult. It's not really a traditional story. <laughs> Although this last year has been a very important year for Alice in Wonderland, hasn't it? Because she was, I think, 150 years old. Yeah. Okay, so um, yes, these are just uh, uh, four others that I added for you to get, get an idea there. Okay, and you all, you all um, mention these four. Okay. Well, the story that I'm going to tell you is a traditional story um, and, sorry, I'm going to go back again. What's so interesting about these particular traditional stories and using them in English is that the children probably already know them in their own language, so they're not worried about not understanding everything um, and they will, they, because they, they understand what the story's about, okay? And a lot of the stories contain some really interesting features that make them suitable for sharing with pre-primary children, okay? So uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to tell you the story of the little white rabbit, which is a traditional Portuguese story. I don't know if anyone in, from Portugal here knows this story. Um, in Portuguese, it's called O Coelhinho Branco, okay, the little white rabbit. And it's a story which I've used with pre-primary children for many, many years. Um, and at the end of this session, you will get a handout with this story. So maybe you'll be able to use it in your own classrooms. OK, as I tell the story, I'm using some illustrations from a famous Portuguese illustrator called Maria Kyle. Um, and the link to the um, place I got the illustrations is here on this particular slide. And um, so as I'm sharing this story, um, and it's one of my favourite ones actually, um, I want you to think about the features of the story that make it suitable for learning English. So what is it about this story that makes it so good for pre-primary English learners? Okay, and you'll see it's, it's a similar topic to topic about, about farm animals. Okay, and this is how the story goes. Once upon a time, there was a little white rabbit. And he lived in a house, and one day he was hungry, rubbing my tummy. So he went to his garden to look for a cabbage, because rabbits like cabbages, don't they? And while he was away, oh my goodness, a goat moved into his house. When little white rabbit came back, he was very surprised, and he looked in the house, knocked on the door, and he said, let me in. And the goat said, oh, I'm Goaty McGee. I'm Goaty McGee. I'll jump on you and I'll break you in three. Oh, little white rabbit was frightened. Oh dear. Well, along came an ox. Moo. How are you, little white rabbit? Oh, I'm a little rabbit. I'm small and white. Look, it's goaty. He gave fright. Shake my legs so, they, so the children can see that I'm frightened. Oh, oh dear, said the cat, said the ox. Please help. Okay, ba -dong, ba -dong, ba -dong. off he goes and he knocks on the door. Tock, tock, tock. <gasps> Let me in. And Goaty McGee says, and you might be able to remember what Goaty McGee says. I'm Goaty McGee. I'm Goaty McGee. I'll jump on you. And I'll break you in three. <gasps> the ox was frightened and he ran away. Oh no, poor little white rabbit. Well, along came a donkey. Eek -oh, eek -oh. How are you, little white rabbit? Oh, I'm a little rab rabbit. I'm small and white. It's Goaty McGee. <gasps> he gave me a fright. <gasps> Please help. Okay, said the donkey. The dong, the dong, the dong, the dong. Knocks on the door. Let me in, said the donkey. And Goaty McGee says, I'm Goaty McGee. I'm Goaty McGee. I'll jump on you and I'll break you in. Three. Oh no. The donkey was frightened and he ran away. Poor little white rabbit. Well, along came a dog. Woof, woof. Hello, little white rabbit. How are you? Oh, I'm a little rabbit. I'm small and white. It's Goaty McGee. He gave me a fright. Please help. Woof. Okay, said the dog. Woof, woof, woof. He knocked on the door. Woof, woof. 
go away! And Goatee McGee said, and I'm sure you can say it with me, <gasps> can you say it? I'm Goatee McGee. I'm Goatee McGee. I'll jump on you and I'll break you in three. <gasps> oh, the dog was frightened and he ran away. Poor little white rabbit. My goodness, what's going to happen next? Along came the cat. Meow. How are you, little white rabbit? Oh, I'm a little rabbit. I'm small and white. It's Goatee McGee. Oh, he gave me a fright. Please help. Meow. Said the cat, okay. And he walks up to the door and he knocks on the door. Meow! Go away! And Goatee McGee said, and I'm sure you can say it with me. <gasps> I'm Goatee McGee. I'm Goatee McGee. I'll jump on you and I'll break you in three. <gasps> and the cat was, you've got it, frightened. And he ran away. Oh dear. Poor little white rabbit. What's he going to do now? <gasps> Along came little Aunt Nelly. Look, little Aunt Nelly, she's tiny, absolutely tiny. <gasps> oh, hello, little rabbit. Oh, are you all right? Well, I'm a little rabbit. I'm small and white. Oh, look, it's Goatee McGee. He gave me a fright. Please help. Okay, said the little white rabbit. Said the little, said little Aunt Nelly. Whoops, I'm getting my names muddled up. Well, little Aunt Nelly. She didn't knock on the door. She's far too clever for that. Well, she went through the keyhole. And she stood there in front of Goaty McGee and she said, Ha! Goaty McGee, go away! Goaty McGee, well, of course, you know what he said, don't you? He said, Ha! I'm Goaty McGee! I'm Goaty McGee! I'll jump on you and I'll break you in three! <gasps> Well, little Aunt Nelly stood there and she said, well, I'm little Aunt Nelly. I'm little Aunt Nelly. I'm going to jump on you and I'm going to bite your belly. Zing! And that's what she did. She bit his belly. <gasps> and Goatee Maggie, he was, he was frightened. And he ran away. Oh! Thank you, said Little White Rabbit. Thank you so much. Ah, oh, look at that. Little Aunt Nelly saved the day. And that's the end of the story. Okay, so that's the story of the Little White Rabbit. Okay, I don't know if any of you know any similar stories <laughs> in, in your own language. A Little Rabbit particularly about an ant that helps him, isn't it? So, oh look, sorry, I forgot to show you. There's the, the, um, the goat and he runs away. <laughs> ah, Irina, so there's a story in Russia. Fantastic, I didn't know that. <laughs> and there's also one in Ukraine. Okay, that's the wonderful thing about traditional stories is there's often a similar one in another country, isn't there? That's great. Anyway, there's the goat going, ah! <laughs> okay, so what makes Little White Rabbit suitable for learning English in a pre-primary classroom? What was it about that story that made it so useful for small children? Do you want to write in your ideas? <clears throat> mm. Well, gosh, absolutely lots of repetition. Okay, that's very typical in a traditional story as well, isn't it? Yes, as each animal appeared, the little white rabbit told her sad story and exactly the same thing happened. That's right, yep. Yes, lots of repetition. Um, yes, there was lots of um, noises and um, lots of repetition. Short sentences, absolutely. Helping each other, that's a nice reason. Yes, the fact that all the animals wanted to help little white rabbit. Yeah. Lots of sounds, yes, lots of animal sounds and the children can help make the animal sounds, absolutely. Children can predict fantastic technology, yes, because they know that everything is always going to happen the same way. So they, once they've seen what happens to the ox and the donkey, of course, they know what's going to happen to the dog and the cat. That's right. Pilar, yes, it's about friends helping. Lots of rhythm. Thank you, Nalida. Yes, lots of rhythm in there. There was rhythm in the, in the rhyme that the little... White Rabbit told and 
hear them in the the, the angle. In this case, there were lots of pretty pictures. That's right. I often use just images of the animals, and I draw a house on a piece of paper and and um, and stick that all. So I've never actually used these particular pictures um, with the children, but I wanted to use them with you because they are actually very Portuguese. Yes, lovely Yvonne, a sense of solidarity. <laughs> That's right. Everyone wants to help little white rabbit. <laughs> okay, so there's a, a lot of very good reasons for why. Now, one of the reasons, and you, none of, no one said that, was that this story is from Portugal. Now, if you're Portuguese, that's fantastic because the children know it. But if you're not Portuguese and you live in another country, it doesn't mean to say that you always have to tell a traditional story that comes from an English speaking country. You, know, you can say that this is a story from Portugal. Isn't that interesting? And we, we're going to share the story in English. And you might talk about you know, where Portugal is if you live in, if you're teaching children in Spain, then of course they will say it's next to Spain. If you teach children in Brazil, they will say, well, yes, and they speak Portuguese in Brazil. Um, and if you could even look at it on, on a, it brings in, um, for the Portuguese children, it means that, that you're um, valuing what they already know. And for those children that aren't Portuguese, then you're you're showing them that you can you can learn a little bit about Portugal through English as well. Okay. Uh, of course, it's about animals, which is a, a topic which lot, many children um, like. Um, Olena here has just said, little beings can do great things, absolutely, and that's the moral really for this story, isn't it? It contains a moral, um, which um, which of course is an important moral. You have to be big and strong help somebody you can be little and ingenious which is just what the little um the little ant was so as you said there's lots of repetition there. there's lots of language which the children will pick up on thank you marina yes the multicultural teaching aspect <laughs> okay um and lots of rhythm and rhyme many of you mentioned that and i'll just tell you a little story about this story is that when i i adapted this many in 1999 with a group of pre-primary um, teachers not English teachers, pre-primary teachers who were working with them. And I was working with them to teach, help them teach English. And um, they we originally um, translated the goat into goatee uh, magive. And I'll break you in five. It's because the gyve and five rhymes as gi and, and three rhymes. And when we told the story for the first time to the children, they went, oh, no, no. Because in Portuguese, of course, it's, it's cabra cabreish partiting tres, the, the word cabreish and tres rhyme, which is three. Um, and so it was easy for us to change this. But I, you know, that's an interesting little story there in the sense that the children were upset about the fact that the story was slightly different in English and they wanted it to be the same. So we changed it and we became Goaty McGee and three. Um, and of course, with this um, story there, oh, it is similar to the Gruffalo, I suppose, Begonia, in the sense that you've got this little mouse who wins through because he's small and ingenious. <laughs> That's right, Margie, as well, yeah. Um, so, and of course, with this story, there's lots of potential for prediction. Many of you said that for sequencing as well. So you can sequence which, um, what happened. You can also order, so you've got an ox, and then you've got um, a donkey, and then you've got a dog, and then you've got a cat, and then you've got an ant, and the animals are getting from big to small. And of course, you're developing um, a mathematical concept there with the children. Uh, and um, of course, lots of opportunity for role play as well. We could make animal masks and role play the story. Arts and crafts there with the animal masks, or even just having, or well, just, I mean, it's, it's a very good thing to do, uh, getting children to draw the um, um, part of the story that they like the best, or to each draw a different part of the story, make their own book and put it in the English corner that they have. So there's lots of potential there for, the, for this particular story in the classroom. So anyway, at the end of this session, you will get a handout with the, the, the story for you to be able to tell in your own classrooms if you want to. Okay. Um, any comments, any thoughts before I move on to the last story I'm going to share with you? Lovely, Yvonne. Yeah, they can perform the story that they love the most. Yeah, it might not be this one, but if it is, that's great. <laughs> Galina's asking for, for some advice about students age 13. 
uh, for stories. Well, this isn't really the place for that, Galena, because this is about pre-primary, okay? So, um, um, I, I'm not going to answer that question, okay? Uh, well, somebody has written here. <clears throat> we can create a Kamish Kamashibai. I don't know what that is. <laughs> Okay. Right. Well, we'll move on because possibly there aren't any more questions, or at least they're not coming through anyway. Okay. So I'll move on to the last story. And of course, I hope that you're collecting tips as we're going along of the ways that we can tell and share a story. Okay. Don't forget that. So you've listened to two stories. So I hope that you've been able to pick up some tips on how you should be telling a story. Okay. Ah, oh, here we go. Penny's way of telling stories. Okay, Marina, thank you. I wasn't familiar with that. Is it is it got to do with a role of, of something? Is that what it is? Okay. Like a mini cinema. Okay, lovely. Yes, thank you. Yes, I know what it is, but I didn't know the name. Thanks. <laughs> thank you, Margie. Okay, great. Right. So picture books. Now, um, picture books are nothing like the the um, um, story that I've, I've shared from Dex um, because picture books are authentic in the sense that they haven't been written for language learning purposes okay and also of course they are books they're not flashcards or story cards or in a course book okay and you will find them in bookshops and English speaking mummies and daddies will buy them for their children now, books, the story I'm going to be telling you is this one here, uh, Monkey and Me. Um, and of course, because um, picture books are authentic in terms of the language that they use, they're also authentic in terms of the um, illustrations because very excellent illustrators usually illustrate them. Okay, so they're very high quality, the illustrations. So of course, there's a visual literacy aspect as well, and we can develop our children's literacy by helping them see and exposing them to different forms of illustration. Um, course book illustration tends to follow a certain format, whereas picture book illustration can be watercolor, can be um, computerized, can be collage, can be photographic, can be all sorts, uh, a real varied amount, and it's lovely. Um, because it's a book, of course, it fosters book knowledge and understanding that a book has a cover, a front cover and a back cover, and it has certain parts which um, make up a book. I'm not going to go into that in too much depth, but, but um, you know, we look at the title page and we talk about the author and the illustrator, if there are two, or the fact that there is a picture book creator who has illustrated and written a book. Very clever if they can do that. Um, and because um, often the stories that we find use words, therefore pre-primary, whereas, of course, you can see the written word in a, in a picture book. And that means that you are supporting and developing the child's understanding of the fact that words exist and represent um, speech. And they begin to, to recognize different letters. I mean, just they look monkey and me, and they will realize that this word here means monkey and represents monkey. And of course, you've got a monkey on the cover as well. Um, and if you're able to leave the book or in the classroom, then it allows for the children to browse through the books, which again is a really important thing for them. So to, you know, they look at the pages. They backwards and forwards, they peer closely, they look for things in the illustrations, a really important part of and um, developing uh, literacy skills there. And of course, if you're bringing books into the classroom, it shows that, um, you know, you value books. And so it promotes a love of books. Okay. Um, and Nadezia says the very hungry caterpillar. Absolutely. Yes. And blue and yellow. Lovely. Yeah. They're your favorite picture books, okay. Um, 
Okay, I mean there are there are thousands and thousands of picture books, and um, it was actually very difficult for me to choose one of my favourite ones. But I wanted to choose a Macmillan children's picture book, children's book, and this is a Macmillan children's book. And Emily Gravett, who is the author and illustrator of this book, she's very very clever. She does the words and the pictures. She's one of my favourite picture book creators. So this is a why I chose this book, and it has a couple of features which I wanted to. Um, talk about with you so that's why okay um, in the handout there's I think uh, six or seven picture book titles that I've selected of authors which you will know for example um, oh, uh, Donaldson Julia Donaldson and the Gruffalo they um, that's a Macmillan children's book um, so I can speak about it freely here in this webinar which is sponsored by Macmillan and uh, you know, the, um, many of um, Julia Donaldson's books are published by Macmillan and some of them, not all of them, some of them are very suitable for pre-primary aged children. The monkey puzzle, exactly Margie, that's on my list. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, so let's have a look at this particular picture book then, I'm going to put it down. Okay, and again, um, I'm going to, as I'm talking to the story, uh, as I'm telling you the story, I'm going to just mention a couple of things that we could do as we tell the story and uh, describe some of the responses that you should expect as you're telling the story. Pirates always wear underpants. Yes, Marina, that's another one. <laughs> isn't that also a Nick, isn't that illustrated by Nick Sharrett? I think so, yeah. Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> so this is the, 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 the picture book, Monkey and Me by Emily Rabbit. Okay, and you can see Monkey, he's got lovely long arms, hasn't he? Of course, if the children already know monkey, then they'll be saying it's a monkey, and you can say, yes, it's a monkey. Some children, especially if they're learning as a foreign language and they only have one or two lessons of maybe 30 minutes a week, um, they might respond a lot in their, in their own language. In my case, it would be in Portuguese because I will live and work in Portugal. And so I let the children respond, you know, talk about the things that they can see. And um, and I always rephrase. I try and repeat what they say, but in English, okay. And this is very important because what's happening is the children are showing you what they're interested in, and um, and and you're rephrasing it. So of course it's important for them and meaningful, okay. So monkey and bee. Now these are quite important parts of the book. They don't. It's before the story begins, but we can see that the main character there is getting dressed, and she's having all sorts of problems with her tights. Look. <laughs> okay, so here we are, Monkey and Me. And this picture book has been dedicated to Amelie. Look at that, can you see Amelie there? It's been dedicated. Did you know that sometimes picture books are dedicated to other people? And you could talk to this, talk about this to the children, and maybe if they do make a class book, they could dedicate it to somebody. So, Monkey and Me, Monkey and Me, we went to see, we went to see some. Do you think she went to see? She's actually pretending to be one of the animals that she's going to see. Can you guess? I'm going to show it to you anyway. Penguins! She went to see some penguins. If we look back, can you see? She's pretending to be a penguin. Yeah, there we go. Penguins. And I just want to comment here on the on the writing. It's very big. So of course the children will see it and they'll recognize it as writing in particular. And you often get children pointing to certain letters and saying, oh, no, I've got a P. They'll say in their, in their, so in my case, children would be saying this in Portuguese. Oh, I've got a P in my name, Pedro, P, Pedro. And you can say, yes, there's a P in Pedro. You can point to that. Okay, it's meaningful for Pedro who has called out. But it's also important for the other children to see that there are, that, and help them understand that there are letters and that they are the same as letters that they have in their names. Okay, <gasps> monkey and me, monkey and me, monkey and me, we went to see, we went to see some. <gasps> Which animals do you think that they went to see? Jumping animals by the looks of it. I think Margie's got it right. Let's have a look. Yes, kangaroos. Oh, look at them. And what catches the attention here are the baby kangaroos in the mummy kangaroos pouches. And so the children will be calling out and you'll be saying, yes, look at the baby kangaroos in the mummy's pouch. So lots of lovely language is coming out there as well. Monkey and me, monkey and me, monkey and me, we went to see, we went to see some. Oh, what do you think? 
an animal which hangs upside down. <gasps> Lily, duh, I think you've got it. Yes, look, bats. Oh my goodness, lots of bats. <gasps> Some children are frightened of bats and they might say that they're frightened of bats. And you could talk about bats. Maybe you could do a little bit in the children's language and say that they don't need to be worried about being frightened of bats. Because look at these ones, they look quite friendly. Well, monkey and me, monkey and me, monkey and me, we went to see. We went to see some, you can see she's really big. And look, she's doing this. Which is the animal that you think that she's gone to see with monkey? Which animal do you think it is? Of course it is. Oh, it's a big elephant. Elephant. Yes, look at that. And there's a mummy elephant and a baby elephant. Monkey and me, monkey and me, monkey and me. We went to see, we went to see. Oh my goodness, look at these. What are they going to see? There are animals that like swinging. Oh, of course, Pilar. Well done. And Tatiana, you've guessed it. Whoops. <laughs> clicked on the wrong thing on my computer. There we go, monkeys. Oh my goodness, look at that. Monkeys, we went to see some monkeys. And of course the children will like to talk about the bananas there, because you can see that they're eating bananas. And they'll say, monkeys like bananas. Of course they'll say it in their, in their own language and you can rephrase it. And then ask the children if they like bananas. Oh, monkey, oh, monkey. Monkey and me, monkey and me, we went, we went home for tea. Oh, she's a very tired lady and a very tired little girl. She had a very long day visiting all those animals. But what the children like about this is that you've actually got a real monkey there. And they bring the monkey. <laughs> That's right. Okay, it's the end of the book here. And those pages at the back, which keep the book together, the end papers have changed, and we've got all the animals that she saw in her day. Okay, lovely, lovely illustration there with the bats. I don't know if you can see the bats here on the um, elephant's trunk as he holds the big elephant. It's a lovely, lovely picture. Look. Okay. So, um, so that's the third story I shared with you. Um, and of course, as I mentioned earlier, you can talk about the author and the illustrator here and um, talk about the name and any other book that you share, which is created by this particular author illustrator, you can make connections and the children love making those connections. If, for example, that you like telling Eric Carle picture books, the author, Ill illustrator and author of The Very Hungry Caterpillar or Brown Bear Brown, then um, they will recognise the similarity between the kinds of illustrations, and that's a very important visual um, de development of visual literacy there. Uh, yes, lots of repetition, that's right, and what's coming. And of course, um, what's important with these is that we should be more than anything responding to children's comments in English, because with a picture book, because it hasn't been written or created for language learners, it's, it's completely authentic, is that there is so much in the illustrations which we possibly don't even um, notice, and, but children will. And so we need to give them the opportunity to interact with you and talk about what they can see and help them say some of the things in English. OK, um, we need to help them read the illustrations. In the case of this particular picture book, of course, the little girl is always giving you a clue. You know, she's being the elephant or they are jumping like kangaroos. And so that, again, is helping the children. Once they realize that the little girl and the monkey are giving them clues, they will be able to predict what's happening next. And that's a great thing to help children do. Um, and of course, by sharing this particular picture book, sharing the love of picture book stories, and you should be leaving it in the um, class book corner. Ivana says it addresses multiple intelligence. Absolutely, yes, it does. That visual aspect and the auditory there, yeah. Um, and yes, okay. So those are the three stories I had to, t to share with you. And of course, you also tell them in quite different ways. I don't know if I felt I did anyway. I told these stories in quite different ways. Um, a zigzag book. OK, Margie, yeah, you could make a zigzag book with the different animals or the children could visit the, visit different animals and they could make their own story. So they could take monkey with them and they could visit uh, lions and uh, giraffes, uh, zebras instead of the animals that were there in the book. 
Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Yes, there's lots of extension activities. Uh, a point I'd like to make also is that with picture books in particular, um, because they haven't been written for language learning purposes, and there aren't a whole set of activities around the picture book, although in many cases all you have um, the, the title, and often you get resources that teachers have created to use with a picture book. But um, it's lovely to tell the story. I'm not going to say just because it's not not just, but share the story with the children for the sake of sharing a story. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing to do. Um, it doesn't have to have a language focus. It can be because you want to share a picture book with children, a quality picture book. And I think that that's a very, very good reason. And children see that English really is for real when you do that. OK. OK, so the tips for storytelling. What did you pick up in terms of tips for storytelling? And the three stories that I shared with you there. Really, yes, changing voices. That's right. Using voices is a good thing to do. Uh huh. If if you feel confident, absolutely. Yeah. Different sounds. Yeah. Especially if animals are involved or the knocking on the door. Absolutely. Body. Yes. I mean, it wasn't easy for me to do it because I'm sitting down. But yes, you should be using your body, using your arms, your legs, stretching, bounce, etc. Um, using of illustrations, yes, well done Irina, especially if you've got those illustrations, you should use them um, to the children's benefit for language learning. Margie says tone, pitch and pace, yep, absolutely, if you can, try and get get your, your, your voice to go up and down and pause. Silence is as important as noise, absolutely. Lots of, choose a story with lots of repetition, yep. Uh, the techniques are more than the number of words. Let's come back to that one. Um, the lots of rhythm. Yes, smiley. Show that you enjoy the story. That's another one. If you don't enjoy the story, then don't don't tell it. So choose a story which you like. Because if you don't if you don't like it, then you will pass on that sort of mm -mm -mm feeling. <laughs> That's very important. Scaffolding in all sorts of ways. Thank you, Ivana. Yes, and creating a friendly atmosphere. So helping the children, um, especially by looking at them eye contact and you can see which children are following and which aren't so you can ensure that they are as involved yep absolutely yes asking them to anticipate and predict or come yes so interaction with the children yes don't just tell the story but try and interact with them as um uh, as spectators because that's what they are isn't it yeah uh, okay Yes, I think you've got lots of tips there. So let's just have a look at my seven storytelling tips. Um, and there are many more. And you've you've shown that there are many more. OK, intonation, Begonia, that's right. So choose a story that you like. Get to know the story and practice telling or reading it. That's really important. So be confident about the story that you're going to tell. OK, practice at home with your husband or your boyfriend or your girlfriend or your wife or your children or your grandma or your mum or your neighbour, whatever. Practice. Uh, and also in, in front of the mirror is a good idea too. So you can see what, what you look like. That's a really good idea. Use your voice for effect. Okay, so that idea of intonation going up and down, loud and quiet, pausing, silence is sometimes as useful as noise. Use gestures and facial expressions. Respond to and acknowledge children's responses. I think this is really, really important. And often a teacher forgets this. Um, they get carried away or quite nervous about storytelling, so they forget to respond to the children. Um, and they don't worry if they respond initially in, in their own language, because you can rephrase that into English. And you'll find that if you repeat the story, which I hope that you do, um, you they will say the same things at the same time. OK, so you'll find it's easy and they will begin to say it in English. <laughs> Natalia, your cat. OK, it's a fantastic. Um, audience, you see, your cat as you tell stories. <laughs> uh, retell the story over several sessions. Um, someone said here using toys to help you retell or, or clothes. Yes, props, that's something else you can use, different props. That's a nice idea as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, and and Nadesha also uses puppets. That's great. Good. Yeah. Okay, so this is what we looked at. We looked at why you use stories, and you had some lovely ideas, and I, and um, pretty much what I had. Uh, we looked at different kinds of stories, um, three kinds of stories, in fact, I shared with you. I shared with you a course book story from Dex. Da -da -da. This was Dex. 
tells the story about the, the farm animal and where's the chick. Um, then I shared a traditional story from Portugal with you called The Little White Rabbit and I shared a picture book story with you and in each case I tried to suggest some activities and the differences between them um, and at the end then we looked at tips for storytelling. Okay, I think that's that's it from me. I've had my, my 60 minutes. Um, anybody got any questions before we go? Catalina asks, is there a place where we can, I'm going to put, I'm just going to say goodbye from Dex. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Bye Dex. <laughs> um, is there a place on, on the net? Absolutely. Um, there are some fantastic storytellers. If you Google storytelling techniques or storytellers, David Heathfield has fantastic, um, I'm just going to, here we go. David Heathfield has some fantastic um, stories that he tells, traditional stories. He's a wonderful storyteller and there'll be lots of lovely, just watching him. I think this is uh, a, another very good thing to do is, 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 is um, watch storytellers on YouTube. Um, Michael Rosen is another um, wonderful storyteller, like A-E-L, isn't it? I spelled that wrong. Michael Rosen, oops, A-E-L, oops, no. H A E L. There we go, Michael Rosen. Um, and in fact, um, we're going on a bear hunt is another good one. We're going on a bear hunt. So I'm just writing that down. Okay, and if you Google Michael Rosen, we're going on a bear hunt, um, is a fantastic video of him telling the story. And he's just such an expressive storyteller. Really, really good. I'm not sure I missed all the other questions. Uh, are there any other questions? But use the YouTube, use the internet to your benefit because there's so much out there, so much out there. And if you choose a story, um, oh, Ezzedin says, how would you introduce the story? Which is more efficient, storytelling or story reading? Okay, introduce the story. It depends on what kind of story you're using and what the context is. But with a course book, it's nice and easy because it will be set. You know, you'll have preparation in, in, in for example, lesson one, lesson two might be your storytelling lesson. And then there'll be lots of associated activities use a course book with stories you don't need to worry about that um, if you are just designing your own materials then you do need to try and choose a story um, which suits the language the children know so you might um, um, be doing farm animals and so you might want to, to tell the little white rabbit story so of course you would tell that once the children are familiar with some of the farm animals that will appear in the story. Okay, so you want to give them something to hang on to that they already know. Um, and if you're sharing a story for, sh for stories sake, of course, choose a story which, which you feel is suitable for them and which you feel is also gives you something that you can work with in terms of um, talking about after or, or, or pure enjoyment because it's a funny story. Um, children will appreciate that. And which is more efficient, storytelling or story reading? Well, possibly if a teacher is not confident about their storytelling um, generally, they might feel more confident if they're reading the story, but try and read it animatedly. But if you tell the story, it's it's so much easier to have eye contact with the children that you're sharing the story with and um, um, therefore interacting and responding with what they're saying. Um, improvising um, and um, rephrasing if you see that you've used words or expressions or there's something that children aren't quite sure about you can rephrase and um, use words that possibly they, they know to help them understand what it is you're trying to say. Um, if you're reading a story of course it will always be the same whereas if you tell a story sometimes you use slightly different words or expressions so you, I think you need to weigh up I would encourage you to be storytellers as opposed to story readers, but you can start as a story reader if you want to gain your confidence. Okay, <laughs> hope I answered that question. Um, I don't know, Henry, were there any more questions I missed? Well, okay, that's lovely. Well, thank you very much for coming and for listening and I hope that you are able to use Little White Rabbit um, and if you use Discovex I hope that you enjoy the stories as well and I hope that you go forth and tell many stories. <laughs> okay, thank you very much for coming. That's goodbye from me and that's goodbye from Dex. <laughs>
Okay, everybody, I'm sorry for the slight delay there. Um, all sorts of problems with my computer today. Anyway, thank you so much to Sandy for her presentation. I hope you all find that um, enjoyable. And Sandy was also kind enough to um, put together a handout for us, which I am um, displaying here on screen now. So you can have a look at that. But it's also, I'm glad to say, uh, available as a download. So if you look beneath the document uh, in the download pod, you will see uh, you can save it to your computer there along with the certificate, of course. So I'm just going to stay here now uh, to allow you some time to do that. Um, unfortunately, it's probably not worth me putting my camera on because it's going to make the computer crash <laughs> and that's not what we want. All right. Um, when I leave the session shortly, I'll send you all onto a link to our webinar survey. Okay. And uh, if you have the time, it would be great if you could uh, just spare five minutes to use that to tell us your thoughts on today's session and add any comments about uh, things we could improve for future. Now, I know there's been one or two technical difficulties today, so of course you can mention those, but sort of more general things, uh, perhaps along the lines of topics you'd like to see covered uh, in future webinars uh, with Macmillan this year. Okay. Uh, so if you've got any last questions, please use the chat box to bring those to my attention now. Otherwise, I am going to sign out in a couple of minutes and take you over to the survey. Um, if anyone's having any problems downloading the certificate, please let me know. Okay, it looks like it's all working. Uh, while I've still got you here as well, I can quickly show you uh, the um, deck. Interested? So two seconds. Do that now. Um, hopefully, you see it on screen now, or perhaps not. Um, I may have just messed things up with my computer again. <laughs> Uh, so anyway, bear with me a second, that might appear for you. Let's see if it does. So anyway, that's the DEX web page, if you're able to see it. So that's dex.macmillan.com um, on the wrong part of the page, actually. So there you go. Home, dex.macmillan.com. And um, we've mentioned it a few times today, but uh, macmillanenglish.com is the place to go to find out about all of our courses publishing this year. There you go, there's a new for 2016 page. Okay, so that's enough from me for now. I'm going to close the meeting and take you on to the survey.